afternoon. Welcome to our first public session on how ideas become policy, getting stuff done. My name is Sarah Mendelson, and I run Carnegie Mellon's Heinz School in Washington, DC. Uh, this is part of a lessons learned from the pandemic. We're doing part of our class on Zoom, open to all Carnegie Mellon staff, faculty, and students. And then I'll meet with the students separately in person, masked, uh, in, in Washington. Today, we're really excited to be joined by Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins to discuss perhaps the penultimate example of how ideas become policy, the coming together and then the adoption by the global community of the Sustainable Development Goals back in 2015. Let me say a brief word or two about my friend Ambassador Cousins before getting into the substance. Elizabeth has been the president and CEO of the UN Foundation since 2020 and has spent virtually her entire career in and around the United Nations. Uh, this includes serving in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2014, both at the US mission, but also as the US representative to ECOSOC and she was the lead US negotiator for us, the United States, on the SDGs. And so her experience is invaluable in discussing the numerous elements of how the SDGs came together. And of course, in her current role is uh, involved in all sorts of issues related to the SDGs. So let's just begin by reminding folks what the SDGs are. And here I'm gonna drop into the, the chat function an inspirational video called We the People for the Global Goals. Uh, and we're not gonna play it now, but if folks wanna go check it out, they'll get a little inspiration. I always start by talking about the SDGs as a paradigm shift in how we think about sustainability, but also development. Obviously the SDGs have a number of goals and indicators that focus on climate and the climate crises but they contain an expanded conception of sustainability that include access to justice, reducing violence, tackling corruption, reducing inequality, for example. And they recognize that development happens everywhere in every country and in every community. Elizabeth, what have I missed? And maybe talk for a moment about how they differ from their predecessor, the predecessors, the MDGs, and what you advise folks on what to call them. Do we talk about them as the UN SDGs, just the SDGs, the global goals? Uh, well, first of all, Sarah, it is so great uh, always to spend time with you. And it's great to have even this virtual way of interacting with your amazing students and faculty. So thank you for that. And I always am eager to talk about the SDGs, as you know. So you know the way you describe them is exactly right. They're a plan for people and planet. There are 17 goals and 169 targets that are designed to give our economies and our societies a chance at a more fair, more healthy, and more sustainable future. And let me tell you a little bit about what that breaks down into. So first, the goals are holistic. They recognize the interconnection between issues, and they try to reverse generations of economics and public policy that have disconnected issues, whether that's food, energy, and water, gender and everything else, and justice and development, et cetera. Second, the goals are universal, just as you said. You know, no country has cracked the code of sustainability, let alone equity. So there is relevance in the goals for everyone, every community, every country. And the goals invite contribution and action from everyone, not just the government setting policy, but businesses, consumers, civil society, citizens. So they're truly universal and truly inclusive. Now, the SDGs pick up the mantle of the Millennium Development Goals, which of course ended um, uh, in, 20, um, in, in 2015. They pick up the unfinished business that needs redoubled attention. So that's around poverty, hunger, education, and health. But the SDGs are a really different proposition. The MDGs were about aid, and the SDGs are about transformation. Now, you asked what we call them. I mean, I think you call them whatever works for you is the bottom line, but I think it's important to call them either the SDGs or the global goals. That's what I tend to use. And not to call them the UN SDGs because they're negotiated at the UN. The UN convened all those conversations and all those negotiations, but they're not about the UN. They're actually about all of us and they are for all of us. So to me, it's really important to, to make that distinction, whatever it is you wanna call them. I totally agree. And the fact that millions of young people around the world 
engaged in the discussion around the agenda coming together, I think is so both inspiring but important. Uh, we're always trying to give people a sense of ownership of this agenda, that if we just rely on entities in New York, we won't achieve the SDGs. Let me, before we go into the process of negotiation and that in incredibly interesting and, and difficult uh, way of getting ideas into policy, this issue of how holistic they are, I think is really important. And, and sometimes what worries me is that the way that society is often organized and certainly bureaucracies, they're siloed. And so we have a real task of, of particularly as we talk to uh, and, and partner with the next generation, thinking about the world in a really different way and really recognizing these connections where previously people hadn't necessarily done that. So that's an important comment. Yeah, just, I mean, a thousand percent. I think, you know, we are all, we all are creatures of systems. We're creatures of habit. We're creatures of politics and interest. And all of those have been expressed over many years in our, you know, our, the way we understand economics, the way we organize the flows of money, the way we think about, you know, policy arenas or, or even just expertise. It's very, um, specialized and fragmented. And what the SDGs are about are about trying to break down those walls. And it's not just because you miss an opportunity in the disconnect, that's partly true, but sometimes because there's a collision between different things you're trying to do. So we have had, you know, an economics that essentially has been at war with our planet, right? So, so the SDGs are about trying to bring those together. We've had an economics that's not been very good at thinking about equity and the kind of mutual support we need to give for each other and the way we need to think about the social impact of uh, economic activity, whether that's as a consumer or producer or something else. So it really is about trying to surface those sometimes tensions, surface sometimes those very fruitful alignments, but really to try to craft, um, and I think we did craft, a framework of goals and targets that give you ideas, strategies, and goals for how to overcome some of those, um, those very significant walls. But it's not to make light of how hard it's going to be to overcome them because they've been around for a very long time. Except that you and I are both products in a sense of an experiment that was undertaken a couple decades ago on field building experts in national security, international security that have a much broader understanding of these issues. Uh, that would include things like development, climate, forced migration, norms. So I do feel some comfort. We, we know that it is possible to expand how people think about these complex challenges because you and I have both been involved in it. Uh, and that is also, I think, one of the reasons why we're so excited at Carnegie Mellon to think differently about these, these challenges. Let's turn to the process that led to the SDGs, both in terms of the public engagement, but then the very critical negotiations that took place in New York. And I want to ask you to reflect, were there moments when you thought, this is really tough and I don't know if it's going to come together? And what changed to enable it to be able to come together? Um, and maybe spend a moment or two on SDG 16, which I think a lot of people found particularly challenging. Um, and it, this has to do with peace, peaceful, just, inclusive communities, but also was foundational, I think a lot of us thought. Yeah, well, when you say were there moments when you thought it wouldn't come together, I want to say there were two years where I thought it wouldn't come together because until you're until you're done negotiating, everything feels like it's hanging in the balance and it and it is really challenging because it was challenging not just because of the politics underpinning some issues, but because there, there are a wide range of very technical areas where you need a really strong base of knowledge in order to even know how to negotiate. So it was kind of all of the above. I'm still sort of amazed that they came together. But let me just say a little bit about the the basics in case people don't know. So first, you know, the mandate for the goals came out of the Rio plus 20 conference. This is the 20th anniversary of the original Earth Summit. And Rio mandated what was called an open working group to come together to work on negotiating the goals. The open working group worked for two years and reached agreement on the goals in the summer of 2014 after this two year, very intensive progress uh, process where, like I said, I don't think I had a moment where I was convinced it would come together until the very end. Um, it's been called the most inclusive negotiation in UN history because of the unprecedented engagement that you mentioned earlier with civil society, with business, with academia, with young people. 
but it was also a completely unique structure of multilateral negotiations, which I'm convinced is part of why we succeeded. So let me tell you a little bit about that, and then I'll use Goal 16 as an example. So Rio said that we had to have an open working group, and there were going to be 30 members of this group distributed across the different regional groups of the UN in proportion to the number of their members. So every group came back from Rio and thought, okay, we're going to figure out our five, seven, nine members to participate in this group, and everyone really, really wanted to be on it. But basically, no regional group, with the exception of the Africa group, which was incredibly disciplined and said, here are our members, none of the other regional groups could choose who would be on it because everybody wanted to be on it. So we went through straw polls and we tried to figure out every possible way to choose a limited number of seats and nobody could do it. Someone in the middle of all this suggested maybe we could share seats. Maybe we could have a kind of constituency system for negotiation. So the 30 seats and that unlocked everything. The 30 seats then became essentially 77 countries encumbering the 30 seats. And because people really wanted to be transparent about this process, because there was so much interest in it, negotiations effectively operated in the open in full transparency. So it was almost like a kind of constant plenary process. But the revolutionary part about it was that because of these constituency seats, the big groups that traditionally dominate the negotiating dynamics at the UN, so that's the G77, which has this kind of group discipline around positions of all countries in the developing world, um, the European Union, which has an incredible discipline about the unified position of its members, the different regional groups, they didn't have a voice in these negotiations because of this unusual structure. So it completely leveled the playing field among countries, big and small, different regions, it created a ton of space for non-usual coalitions um, across regions, and it enabled countries to really speak authentically about what mattered to them. So if you're a small country, you're not going to get kind of, you know, subsumed into some group position. You're going to speak for yourself. And especially because we had two years to talk through it, you really heard with incredible granularity what countries cared about and, and why what they were pushing for. So to, to move to goal 16, this is the peace and peace and, and good governance goal, essentially, peaceful and inclusive societies. And it was incredibly controversial for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, some countries thought, wait, that's just masking a peace and security goal and that has no business in the heart of a development agenda. There were some who felt that this was just going to be a stalking horse for all the old aid conditionalities around good governance. There were a lot of reasons that a lot of countries had some misgivings, but you had a number of countries who'd been through serious conflict and come out the other side, often with the sort of support of the UN as it happens, um, who played an incredible leadership role in, in advocating for this goal and why it mattered to them. So that's countries like Timor-Leste, countries like Liberia, a number of Central American countries who were one of the first to come up with this idea of terming it peaceful and inclusive societies, which created space for people who were nervous to be able to actually you know, talk about it. It wasn't a peace and security goal. It was actually about something broader and deeper. Without that structure of negotiations though, those countries who had the authenticity to say, this is why peace matters to me because I couldn't develop as a country if I didn't end my war and kind of build the institutions of an inclusive post-war order, um, they would never have had the same voice and been able to exercise that leadership. Um, so we really owe them a great, great debt of gratitude and whatever you know aspect of kind of our own dysfunction and being able to choose a limited number of seats contributed to us having this structure that was so ingenious. That's the other piece of it. It's interesting. When I was at USAID, I was the interagency lead for what was goal 12, which was rule of law. And somebody who I worked with was handling the peace and security piece. So goals 12 and 13 merged into 16. And it, you know, you're having these conversations in Washington and with colleagues around the world, but then it morphs into something else in New York and having all those people and particularly those people coming from countries that had emerged from war were so critical. Uh, so that's a very evocative explanation of how that negotiation went. This finds us in September, 2021. Um, it's been a tough summer. Um, talk to us about where we are now on the SDGs, both what gives you hope, but what are you worried about? And I have to ask, how, how do you think that COVID has impacted the decade of action? 
No, it's a great question. It has been a really hard year on so many levels, and I guess not just a year, right? We keep thinking about talking about it as the last year when in fact it's, you know, it's getting on to two. And there's nothing like a global pandemic to bring home how interconnected we are as a human society and how dependent we are actually on each other's choices um, and each other's commitments. Look, we're not in a great place on the SDGs. Um, before the pandemic, we had made some progress in some areas, but we already weren't moving fast enough. And the pandemic has set so much so far back. So, you know, and you just pick your number, the millions of people who've been who moved back into poverty, the number of kids who are out of school or have lost critical aspects of their education, women who've been, you know, bumped out of the workforce and may never go back. You know, we had that dip in carbon emissions in 2020 that people thought, well, maybe this is showing people that actually we can we can have a slightly different impact um, uh, on our natural world in that way, but it's skyrocketed back up already with 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 recovery. So, you know, my overall worry, I'm going to start with the worry before I get to the hope, is that between the forces of change, which are so imperative and the forces of inertia, inertia could win, right? Inertia and habit could could win because it's just it's hard to make change at scale. But it's obviously essential that that not happen. So the challenge to all of us, um, and there is a very diverse coalition and set of constituencies around the SDGs, and it plays out differently in different geographies and different sectors, but it's not small. The challenge to all of us is really to devise strategies for change. They're all about acceleration. They're all about scale find pathways to get us out of incremental behaviors that are just so easy to kind of stay within. Um, and what gives me hope is that there are a lot of really powerful ideas and influencers and again, constituencies that see that path and want to be on it. So, you know, you've mentioned young people. We work a lot with young people at the UN Foundation in different, in different ways. And there is a drive, a determination, and incredible smarts. I mean, way smarter than I ever was at that, that age. You know, really wanting to apply, apply themselves, their time, their talents, their networks to this kind of scaled and accelerated change that is so essential to have the sort of societies that are healthy enough to live in, and that we, you know, we want not only for our children but for our children's children. So that's what gives me hope. And I see that also in business leaders that we work with in different sectors, and in different um, civil society organizations um, as well. I mean, I guess I feel the real. Even when I am a little bit down on where we are, there is no other plan B. I mean, there's so, to me, there's so much logic in this agenda and so much urgency uh, that it keeps propelling me forward, um, even when sometimes it feels like there is that inertia. But let's talk about leadership in the United States on this agenda, because um, in the Trump administration, <laughs> we saw a lot of walking away from multilateralism in general, but not any conversation about the SDGs whatsoever. Um, I had colleagues working in government at the time who were told not to mention the SDGs, while the Trump administration did not publicly declare they were walking away, just as they did with the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Um, there was, on the other hand, a lot of US leadership in different localities, um, particularly with mayors. Um, and we are, I would say, waiting still to see where the Biden administration is on this agenda, although so many policies that they've adopted elegantly align with the SDGs, even if they haven't used that language. But why don't you tell us a little bit about what your perspective is on US leadership um, and things that actually UNF has organized? Yeah, no, happily. I think, you know, I'd start where you where you did, which is US leadership has many faces. So yes, it's the federal government, which has certain things that the federal government can only and uniquely do, but it's so much more. It's mayors, it's governors, it's community leaders, it's students, it's universities, it's faith groups. And when you look at that uh, broader canvas uh, of leadership, that's where, to me, it gets really exciting. So in the, in the four years of the Trump administration, you know, some of that was compensatory because you weren't seeing leadership at the federal level on any of these issues. You know, on the climate was probably the most pointed aspect of that um, with the pullout of the, from the Paris um, Climate Agreement. 
um, we actually support at the UN Foundation something called the US Climate Alliance, which is a coalition of governors. It's now 26 governors strong, Republican and Democrat across the country, not just the coasts, who were committed to staying in the Paris Agreement. And what's interesting to me about that is that, yes, they came together in the, you know, the sort of hostile environment for climate that was the Trump administration. But they came together not even because they cared about Paris per se. They came together because they saw that climate action and climate leadership was in the interest of their citizens, the interest of their constituents. If they want to win the race for the good jobs and the strong economics of the future, they want to have healthier communities, more equitable communities, that's what they need to deliver to the people who voted them into office. And for them, climate leadership was essential. Um, you mentioned mayors. You've had incredible leadership from you know, city leaders in all kinds of uh, sizes and scales. Um, you have all sorts of leadership from you know, young people, again, from community organizations, et cetera. So, so that's, the trick is to mobilize and put further power underneath that, because then especially when you have a partner in the federal government, then you can really go somewhere and it's very, very, very strong and powerful. And in terms of the Biden administration and the SDGs, I think you, you said it exactly right. If you look at the content of their policies, they're deeply aligned with the whole logic of the SDGs. Everything from the emphasis on equity, you know, the, the kind of moral core of the SDGs is to leave no one behind, right? It's to, it's to really think about the most vulnerable and how do you have strategies to really support the most vulnerable among us and reduce inequalities. That's powerfully central, it seems to me, to the Biden administration's domestic policy, um, climate change, good health, et cetera. So, so I, I think that's very promising, actually, because you can match leadership on the federal side um, and hopefully the congressional side together with uh, together with all of the diverse and, and really powerful sources of leadership and dynamism out there in the broader American community. Yeah, one of the first executive orders, maybe it was the first executive order the Biden administration issued, stood up a working group on disaggregated data uh, <laughs> as a, I mean, talk about wonky, but as a way of tackling inequities Right, so perfectly fitting in with the SDGs, and and I think a lot of the conversations, the expert conversations that we have, are about the need for disaggregated data in order to know and understand and not leave anyone behind. Um, that it's it's really fundamental. I also think that um, my understanding of how international governance has. Um, evolved in the last couple decades has a lot more power for cities, right? If we think of the 19th century as kind of empires and the 20th century as countries, I feel like there's a lot of vibrancy in cities, both in terms of their economies, but also there's a lot of engagement by mayors to mayors. And this agenda is so uh, suited for that kind of thing. Um, and so I, I feel like there's a lot of excitement when we see it also with universities. I mean, there's a lot of us in the university world who are talking and collaborating with one another um, on this agenda. So yeah, we're, we're a majority urban species at this point. Yes, it's only, at this it's point. only increasing. And so, you know, I think again, it gets to this question of direct connection and relevance to people. There's a lot of talk right these days about the localization revolution within this arena of how you really can get granular about what matters to real people in real places <laughs> in real ways and how you develop strategies for delivering that. I think, um, you know, city leaders, state leaders are really close to their constituents. So in a very different way, they have different incentives and they have, I think just it's, this agenda can have a different and even more powerful kind of traction at that level. I am reading the new localism, which was published by Brookings over the weekend. So yes. Um, so what do you see outside the US and outside the UN, where do you see pockets of excitement around the SDGs, um, both in terms of different sectors, but different countries and, and, and different cities. I mean, if we're looking for examples to you know, best practices, where, where would you look? 
Yeah, well, there are a lot of places to look. I mean, so I, you were first, I, I have been really struck by the uptake in the business sector. Now, that doesn't mean every company or every global company loves the SDGs. Um, and some who love the SDGs, it's a little superficial. So you have to really dig deep to understand how serious the commitment. But there are so many companies that cross sectors that really do have a deep commitment to the SDGs. And for some of them, that's trying to embark on a process of real change that they recognize is going to be hard, but that they want to embark upon. Um, it requires changes in business models. It requires work in supply chains. It requires sometimes a, a different kind of engagement with consumers, depending on the nature of the company. So I do think there's a, there's a lot um, to be learned from, to support and reinforce in terms of some of the business leadership on the SDGs. You know, we were just, as an aside, involved a few years ago with something called the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, which was just a, a two-year exercise to bring together CEOs from a number of sectors and countries to talk about what the business agenda was for the SDGs and to make the business case. And among the things they found were that the SDGs, um, if you even in just a few areas, like healthcare was one of the big ones, but there are a handful of other sectors, could generate trillions of dollars in new market value and up to 380 million new jobs. So, you know, those are big numbers and that starts to have a really transformative impact if business embraces it. And of course, if governments adopt the sort of policies that can also reinforce that, um, you know, young other, you know, places to look, young people in youth networks around the world are, are just an incredibly energizing source of demand uh, and ideas and, and, and sources of action. Um, and, and if you think about countries, cities, I mean, there really is a wide menu to pick from. I think you do see some countries who are more, who recognize the value of overcoming silos and particularly kind of, I would say mid-sized countries who have mm -hmm maybe less bureaucracy than some than some larger um, governments who shall go unnamed that have a little bit more challenge overcoming some of their own their own you know kind of deep bureaucratic structures who've seen the value in bringing together their cabinets their line agencies etc in a very different way around some of these cross cutting cutting issues and that that's a way to be more effective again and deliver for their you know for their constituents and their and their citizens here's what i observed uh, in New York in um, July 2016, Finland uh, brought over a delegation and they invited everybody you know, to see their progress on the SDGs. This is just six months in, right? And they did this presentation. It was a breakfast meeting early in the morning. I wasn't expecting much. Um, and I was like, oh my God, they've been doing <laughs> this work for 30 years, right? I mean, it wasn't just that they'd pivoted and in six months they had this amazing story to tell they were built for this. This is a lot of what underpins the way they think about governance and the economy and, and all of that. So you can see there are certain countries that are really, I mean, even countries that emerge, for example, from World War II, where they had to develop in a post-World War II environment. So the idea of development to them was not strange or anomalous. And then there's the category of countries that it lived through the MDGs, right? So they already had, you know, somebody in the president's office who's reporting out on these issues. And I felt, you know, as we were sort of doing these, what we call now Zoom sessions, but civets into conversations with the State Department about the SDGs, and none of us owned anything, right? We weren't heads of government, we weren't heads of cities. I felt that we, the way the United States is structured on some level, we are at somewhat of a disadvantage. Yes, there are things at the federal level that you can do. And certainly if our international development assistance is aligned well with the SDGs, that would be very powerful. You could see donor dialogues going on, but there is so much decentralization in the United States. We really have to have mayors and private sector and civil society universities engaged in this agenda. No, ab absolutely, absolutely. So talk to us a little bit about the UN Foundation. I think for a lot of people, it may not be uh, obvious that you were not the UN. Um, so who are you exactly? What's your relationship to the UN? And what are you all most focused on in terms of the SDGs? Yeah, so no, we get that question all the time. So it's, it's not it's not just you. Everyone always asks, are you the UN or, or an independent organization? So we're an independent charitable organization. We were created 22 years ago um, to support the UN and UN causes. 
And we were created around a billion dollar gift from Ted Turner, who surprised everyone by going to a Ford's gala dinner for the United Nations Association. He'd obviously been thinking about it before the dinner, but it nonetheless surprised people and said, you know, I've done really well in this last year. My balance sheet looks better than it did a year ago. I'm going to take a billion dollars that I won't miss if it's not there. And I want to give it to something I really care about, which is this idea that people working together globally can solve the biggest challenges we face uh, as a society. So uh, turns out though, that if you wanna give a billion dollars to the UN, there was no way to do that mm -hmm. as a private individual. So they created the foundation initially to channel the gift, but the mission always was to use his gift to leverage even more support, more resources, more friends, more partnerships, new ideas. And that's really been core to the mission from the beginning, which has also meant that we've done a lot of different things over the years. So always with that mission of supporting the UN and UN causes, but very much adapting to what the needs were of the moment. We have always had um, from the beginning a very strong uh, team that supports um, the US relationship and US support for the UN that works on Capitol Hill to build and maintain diverse support for paying you know, US dues to the UN and for supporting different programs, but also works around the country. Um, in fact, through the United Nations Association, where we've helped create uh, chapters of the UN Association on college campuses in every state of the union, which is very exciting and an incredible base of diverse and young support for the whole idea behind what the UN stands for. And I would say now about half of what we do is incubate different kinds of initiatives that are all multi-sector and multi-stakeholder in nature that are designed to solve some aspect of the SDG or the climate challenge. So um, the, I mentioned the U.S. Climate Alliance earlier that sits with us. The Clean Cooking Alliance sits with us. We have a number of data related uh, partnerships that are housed at the foundation. So it just allows us to kind of be really connected to some of the most practical hands-on work that's trying to drive change around the SDGs while also you know, doing some of the policy work that we've done from the very beginning. And you're explicitly trying to lift up the work that uh, in the United States, US leadership and its different forms on the SDGs. Well, we are. So if the, you asked what our priorities are at the moment within the SDGs and part of us, you know, we need to always stay responsive to what's helpful to the UN so that can that can change over time. But we've been doing progressive work, including with you and Carnegie Mellon over the last couple of years to really create platforms for connecting um, diverse sources of leadership on the SDGs, whether that's from universities, businesses, states, etc., young youth organizations. Um, and to see how we can put some support underneath that, not just tell the stories of where that's happening, but actually, in, again, in very practical ways, connect people who are doing aligned work, see ways that we can help um, direct resources or support behind that so that it can really have even more, even more gas. So that's a very exciting um, aspect of our work. Uh, a couple of other areas that we are very um, preoccupied with. So, you know, that is all about how to get further faster by 2030 when the goals come due. So one big piece of our, our portfolio that's growing is around this question of leaving no one behind, mm. developing, working with a lot of different partners, but trying to develop new tools and, and strategies for how you really direct sustained and high level attention to the most vulnerable across our communities, particularly around poverty, but not only poverty. You know, the, the kind of easy job of poverty re reduction has already been done, right? It's done by the markets. It's done by, you know, the global economy. The hardest bits are the stubborn bits. So trying to figure out what different strategies and tools do you need? And that's going to, you know, be different across different, different societies, but that's kind of one big piece of work. And the other is accountability. And this is something we're really just trying to explore with, again, with partners, but there's all kinds of reporting mechanisms for the SDGs. There's so much data out there. Nonetheless, even that has its degree of fragmentation. And I and we all kind of feel is missing a little bit of that sharp edge of cumulative coming back. You made a promise last year. Where are you this year? How do you follow up the few? And that very is it's particularly, I think, challenging with respect to financing, where a lot of there's a lot of incentives to make promises and pledges, <laughs> and it's very hard to, to track whether it's really coming through or in the right ways. So we're trying to explore some different kind of tools and ideas for how to put a little bit of an additional um, uh, little strength behind that for that could that could help support advocacy of you know wide variety of, of, of partners and people interested in getting the SDGs done. 
And I should say we are uh, looking forward to working with the UN Foundation on a capstone project that is particularly focused on leave no one behind and trying to translate that and it emerges from this exercise we're about to talk about, the 17 rooms exercise. Uh, we're looking at the impact of COVID relief and recovery packages on populations in Pittsburgh, Atlanta, and Toronto. Uh, and to the extent that we see populations being left behind, who are they? What do those numbers look like? And how do you make the SDGs really accessible for policymakers? How do you translate this and, and you know, in a lot of ways, we're rifting off the work that Krista Rasmussen, who works with you, and John MacArthur did at Brookings. And we think that that's exciting. We have university partnerships as well. Um, and all of this came out of these conversations that we had in, in, for my case, room 16, but also talk to you a bit in room 13. Let's just step back for a second. You and I have both been involved in this exercise that the Brookings Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation run called 17 Rooms. And when we at Carnegie Mellon did a version of it in May uh, 2020, early days of the pandemic, we did a 17 Zooms, if you will. How would you explain 17 Rooms and why do you think this exercise is valuable? Yeah, no, and I've been, uh, I, th I think I was present at the very first one and have been, um, and just a, a really, um, a loyal, a loyal customer ever since. So the, the basic idea is that, you know, first there's incredibly powerful expertise, ideas and action within any given goal area. And that if you bring that together in a regular way and ask those individuals to look at what, to, to give them the discipline of saying in the next year, what are some breakthroughs that need to be made? What are the opportunities? And really focus on what could be done in a, in a defined period of time in their goal area. That alone is worth doing. But it's even more powerful if you also do it across goal areas because, you know, ocean experts don't always talk to poverty experts, don't always talk to equity experts. And so bringing the, the kind of really rich ideas and energy from within kind of deep communities of practice and thinking within the goal areas and then across them is essentially what's ha what happens in this now quite designed process around 17 rooms that really is structured in a way to bring out those interconnections, to bring out that ideation and really, and but to keep us all focused on practical things. So not just, gee, we're all interconnected, how nice is that? But what can you get done in the next year? Who do you need to do it? Use this process as a way of bringing on allies and friends and getting some focused work done. So it's a, it's a rich and evolving community of leaders, practitioners, advocates, uh, et cetera, that also can be franchised. Essentially, you know, there is, one process that happens in and around the General Assembly week in New York, but it's in fact global and we owe that a little bit even more, I have to say, to the last year and a half where we have found remarkable ways to diversify our you know, conversations. Um, but it can also then be picked up by universities, by communities, by businesses for that matter, who want to use the technique to try to get more focused um, and kind of integrated attention to the goals or a given goal in their community. So it's a really, it's an incredibly clever idea that if someone hadn't thought of it before, it would be, you know, it's time would have come. And I like to say, it's like the Abbey Hoff, you know, st steal this book. It's like steal this, steal this process, steal these rooms and do it yourself. Cause it really can be adapted to any community. Yeah, it's been, for me, I think extremely important to have a community to keep going back and touch base on a set of issues, but also trying to come up with not the perfect step, but what's the next step uh, and really trying to get pragmatic and practical. Um, and this brings us back to um, youth and what I like to refer to as cohort 2030. I mean, if we think about if you're 18 in 2020 and you're 28 in 2030, what we're able to achieve by 2030, you're gonna carry forward um, into the next 15, 20 years, right? There'll be some successor to the, the SDGs and I suspect many of the SDGs will continue. Um, as, a, as a result of our Room 17 or Room 16 conversation, we have some support from the Rockefeller Foundation and we have, and I'm gonna drop this into the chat function, but you can also go to, uh, if you Google the challenge fund call for applications or the cohort 2030 challenge fund uh, and CMU, the PDF will come up. There's 
a way to um, engage any student in Carnegie Mellon over the next year, particularly around the 16 plus agenda. And I encourage people to, to go check out the, the PDF. But you know, in a lot of ways, we've seen youth movements, whether it's around climate justice uh, or racial justice or gun violence in this country, uh, again, pop up, but also have a lot of synergies with the, with the SDGs. On the other hand, this is a really big agenda. You know, we talk about 17 goals and then indicators and targets. Um, what do you say to young people about how they can get involved and, and how do you make it sort of bite-sized so that they, they have something practical that they can do that they feel engaged in? Yeah, no, I mean, it is a big agenda, but I, you know, there's no bad answer to this question is the first thing, right? And it's it's your point, and you borrow it from 17 rooms that it's not about the perfect step, it's about the next step. So, so first, there is no wrong answer to how to engage, <laughs> this is the first thing. Second, I really encourage people to just you know, you don't have to read every target, read your way through the goals and think about them and then think about what speaks to you. Not every goal is going to have equal relevance in everybody's life and it doesn't have to, right? I mean, the fact that they hang together as a framework is, you know, there's a lot of thought and care that went into that, but that doesn't mean you have to move out on every goal in equal measure because they're going to be really different for different people in different communities, depending on what they face. I mean, right now, everything related to health is top of mind for absolutely everybody on the planet. And, you know, that changed from two years ago. And so I think giving, you know, yourselves the, the you know, the, the grace to kind of go at it and figure out what speaks to you and work on that thing in, in, in whatever way is meaningful. And that can be about just even thinking about it and kind of making some intentional choices in your daily lives about the food you eat and, you know, how you treat others. It can be organizing around something. It can be telling stories. It can be reaching out to, to, to colleagues or, or people outside of your community. Um, you know, I, I also, I see a fair amount, and I know you do too, see incredible innovation around some of the SDGs ideas that are, that are stimulating everything from social innovation to technological innovation and digital innovation to think about how do you get this done? So I think for young people, especially who are, you know, figuring out what they want to do in life, they're, they're thinking about, you know, where, where they want their time and talents to take them. It can be incredibly exciting to think about grabbing onto some of these ideas and, and, and see how they might manifest themselves in your life. You can also reach out and call your Congress people and tell them to care. That's actually a great thing to do. <laughs> Uh, yes, and in fact, Representative Barbara Lee has uh, legislation in Congress around the SDGs. Um, one of the things that might be interesting to students as they think about the, the Challenge Fund is to put together a policy advocacy toolkit for the busy student who wants to call their member uh, if they have a member. I live in the District of Columbia, and as do you, <laughs> we don't have members of Congress, so we count on, <laughs> so, right, we, we, we rely on others. Um, but yes, and also, you know, this, this aspect of technology for good or the digital, again, I think for students at Carnegie Mellon, that's an especially uh, important place, but also, you know, Carnegie Mellon is a place where there's a lot of creative work that goes on. There are a lot of Tonys. I personally would like to see a musical around the SDGs. If you can do a musical on Hamilton, which some say originated um, at Carnegie Mellon, you could do a musical on the SDGs. So I throw that at, out as a challenge. But also this behavioral change on your own part, um, whether it's stopping the use of plastic bottles, or maybe you're buying new clothes less, um, maybe you're repurposing what you have. Maybe you're walking more. Um, maybe you, you decide to have one car, maybe that car is electric. I mean, I think all of these decisions um, are in the capacity for people to make and they're, they add up, you know, so it all- You're making decisions every day anyway about your behavior. So it's just a question of kind of how conscious you are about their impact. Um, I would also say on the policy toolkit idea, um, check out www.unausa.org. <laughs> so not to, to to give a shameless plug, but UNA does do a lot of that kind of thing and would be really thrilled to I think, share at least what they've what they've done and developed in a way that might be, be, be interesting. Say, to say the website one more time, www.unausa.org. 
it actually is hyphenated in real life, but in the URL, it's not hyphenated. Okay. Awesome. I think. Let me make sure. I didn't come prepared to drop things into chat. <laughs> it's okay. I did. Um, and I'm sure that if for some reason it's done incorrectly, we, people will let us know. It. Yes. You're a pretty, pretty savvy cohort. <laughs> yes. Um, particularly when it comes to uh, technology, way ahead of, of where I am at. Um, so imagine that we're getting to December 31, 2030. What, what's the headline that you'd want to see? What, what do you, what do you, what do you want to wake up and see maybe on January 1? Yeah, done and dusted would be really nice <laughs> to see. Um, I, uh, look, I, I think I would love to see that some big pieces of this agenda really do move. Uh, particularly around poverty, particularly around equity, and particularly around climate and and the natural world, which, you know, if those things don't move, and there are of course many different aspects of all of it, but you know, we're 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 heading it alternatively, we will be heading to a very impoverished place as a world in terms of the you know capacity of the planet to sustain us in a in a in a way that not only actually sustains our health but also excites us and fires up art and imagination in all the ways that i think we've counted on and trusted for you know for all of our lifetimes our societies won't be healthy um, let alone equitable um, and just as individuals you know we will we will we will be in a darker place so i think to me the exciting thing is if we can shift our trajectories, get on the right paths, and they're all really articulated in, in the SDGs. And, you know, the headline, even if the headline says we're halfway there on some critical things, it will be a really big deal. So, you know, I'm, I, I think we can, I, I do feel very fired up when I, when I talk to different sectors and communities with whom we work, that there is, you know, to your point earlier, there is so much urgency to this agenda and the logic is just impeccable. Like there's no, there's no counter argument, actually. <laughs> the only argument is how, how fast. And so that really is the challenge for all of us is the how fast part, especially. So we're meeting in September. This is, of course, the beginning of the UN General Assembly, but this fall is also going to be the big climate um, conference in Glasgow, COP26. The, the issues of poverty, equity, and climate, to what extent do you think they're going to be woven through and knitted together um, in Glasgow? What's your oh, expectation? I yeah, I know. I, I think they already are really core to the whole theory of the case in the climate community with the, you know, COP hosts. It doesn't mean that it's already achieved, but in terms of intent, in terms of, you know, the kind of hard wiring into the agenda, that is very palpably um, at the core. So, you know, the climate justice questions have you know, have risen in just a very short period of time. I think as we've seen the incredible um, inequity of even short-term climate impacts, whether it's here or any, any number of other places around the world or across the world. And so, you know, I think you're seeing that the whole question of just transition um, is, is really central to what the task is. And that's reflected in the preparations for Glasgow. Again, it doesn't mean it's going to be all done, but it does mean that that's what's inspiring the level of ambition people are bringing to it. And it really matters. I mean, the combination of a global pandemic and the climate crisis, it seems to me, you know, perhaps when we get a little bit further along and, and the vaccination rates around the world go up, that there will be this spring in our step, that there will be real motivation to say, you know, we, we've just lived through the two, we're living through these two connected and, and um, urgent crises, and this is the way forward. Yeah, look, I, I do think there is, um, there is a test before all of us, and the test is COVID, because that is in the, that is right with us right now, and we're not meeting the test yet certainly in terms of the equity of response, but even in terms of the sufficiency of response uh, anywhere. So, you know, I, I do think for, for broader credibility about the ability to take on even bigger challenges, we have got to pass this test. Um, and that's why you're seeing so much uh, drive going into really pushing the point about equitable, um, you know, distribution of vaccines and, and other measures and really stepping up that aspect of the, the global response. I think you'll see that very powerfully at UNGA. 
you'll see that kind of energy in a forthcoming report of the Secretary General that's coming out later this week called Our Common Agenda, that that's the gate through which you need to drive in order to get to, get to all the other, you know, cooperation around all the other issues that are, that are around us. So just recovery being absolutely connected to the uh, equ the, dis the equitable distribution right. of vaccination. Oh, absolutely. So the work that you're doing to kind of to track that is going to be incredibly is the kind of thing that's incredibly important so that you but first of all know how well we're doing or not. Um, and then can use that um, uh, in advocacy can use that in in pressing for for any changes that there need to be. Yes, data driven policy making. That's what we like to see. It is um, usually better that way. Usually better that way. Um, listen, thank you so much. Uh, any parting shots? Any anything that you want to add? Uh, only that I miss meeting your students in person, and I'm really sorry not to have the opportunity to do it. Um, but I, I hope you'll ask me back on some other occasion so that I will be able to because I know they're awesome because I see in your enthusiasm for your teaching, um, you know, what a wonderful community you're able to be part of. Both in Washington and in Pittsburgh, and we actually are having a university-wide annual conference. This year it's moved to February, usually it's in September, it's called Intersect. And the theme is the Sustainable Development Goals. So um, more on that shortly. Um, I wanna thank Elizabeth Cousins for, for joining us. Next week, we're gonna be joined by Steve Feldstein, uh, who is a former colleague from USAID and the State Department, and he's going to be talking about digital repression uh, and his new book, um, which is titled The Rise of Digital Repression, How Technology is Reshaping Power, Politics, and Resistance. Uh, and he has also a piece out, Technology, Democracy, and the Biden Administration. So that'll be September 15th from noon to one. Um, and thank you very much. Be well, stay safe. You too. Thank you.